Uh, Kate Cox is managing partner of Havas Media and is going to talk on the subject of brand as an organising principle. Uh, Kate, some of you will know, spent 19 years in the industry, over 10 of those with Havas Media. She's co-authored co a report for the IPA, New Models of Marketing Effectiveness from Integration to Orchestration. And orchestration is our theme. Um, because you remember at the beginning, I talked about how in the construction industry, the great challenge was aligning everybody to the same objective. Uh, in a way, what Kate is going to do is talk about how brand, when you've got multiple stakeholders, uh, when you've got lots of people involved, the brand should be the kind of unifying goal, the unifying uh, force that holds everybody together. So I'm going to ask Kate to come up and speak. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So why is a media girl um, of 19 years, probably a bit longer, um, talking about brands? Uh, the IPA asked me to uh, collaborate on this work. It was actually an idea to write this study of the data mine. It was a publicist idea. And what we were finding was we needed some sort of channel experts to kind of bring the idea to fruition. So I got involved because I've spent the last decade trying to figure out this integration issue. So like many of the people in this room, I too sit in those multi-agency meetings trying to figure out how integrated marketing works, how we can all get the best results for clients, um, and how it all works. And what I discovered five years ago when we were starting this project was integration was a really fuzzy term. It was defined completely differently from, by ad agencies to direct marketing agencies to media agencies to clients. Clients has a completely different understanding of what they needed in terms of integration. So I was interested when the IPA approached me to really try and figure it out. Um, and I'm going to borrow a couple of uh, metaphors from Libby Childs, who I think is still here, or um, was here, yep, yeah, um, from Appraise, because she then um, has been writing a lot on client relationships around the subject of integration and orchestration. Um, the first um, topic, it is, she gave a talk at the IPA, and this really struck me, was are client and agency relationships like a sort of, you know, 16th century, 17th century pirate ship? Um, you know, there's a client at the helm who sort of knows the direction that they're going, but not sure exactly the course they're plotting. Um, and the crew is a completely, you know, disparate band um, with completely different objectives, trying to figure out how to actually pilot the ship. So I love that. That was a really evocative metaphor um, for actually what it does feel like sometimes to be working um, in some of these teams. The other metaphor I liked um, from Libby was this one, the two small tablecloth. And I think this came from an agency MD, which was sometimes it feels you sit in a room uh, with a tablecloth in front of you that's too small for the actual table, and there'll be an agency pulling it more towards them, and there'll be another agency pulling it more, more, to, more towards them. So, and actually, it does feel like that. It, it absolutely feels like a too small tablecloth. Um, and the study that she did, which was talking to lots of... Um, really high-profile global marketing directors about their relationships and integration, specifically around how agencies work together, was that there was this big mismatch between what clients really want, which is joined-up thinking, really big ideas. Give me an enormous big idea that transcends the organisation and all the activation can work across it. Do it quickly. Um, really think about my long-term future. And actually, what clients at the time were getting, I think this study was done about two or three years ago, uh, mismatched timelines, uh, lots of infighting, some short-term tactical one-offs and lots of reactive um, responses to the brief. And actually, in terms of the agencies, what do agencies want? Um, well, they want um, retainer relationships. Who wouldn't want a marriage rather than a, a one-night? Um, strategic partnerships. So, you know, we want to understand your business and become your trusted value advisor. Real clarity in briefs and everyone, every agency wants one-on-one -on -one time with clients. But instead, we're getting more projects, supplier relationships, cross-agency, chaotic melting pots, the too small tablecloth too many times. Um, and actually, what is the answer to this dilemma that we're facing? Um, and the hypothesis here um, from the IPA database is actually brand 
is the organising principle. So this is the um, new models from integration to orchestration that came out in 2011. And we've also looked at Les and Peter's work that came out this year, the long and short of it, um, to come up with the sort of conclusions. So what this says um, and how this study worked, so what happened was we read all the IPA effectiveness case studies and categorised them into four camps. Um, no integration, so there was no attempt to make all those channels work together. They were definitely silos and everyone was happy with the silos. Nothing looked or acted the same. Advertising-led, which was oh, a lovely big idea that went across all the channels. So the direct marketing looked like the TV and someone had changed the IVR on the customer sales centre to actually reflect what was in the ads. Um, so real advertising-led. Something called brand idea-led, which was this big 35,000-foot idea that really transcended the organisation. Um, and participation-led. We were really interested in it at the time, because it was two or three years ago. It was all those lovely Walker's Crisps ideas and getting everyone to choose a flavour. Actually, how effective were they in terms of um, effectiveness? You know, how did they drive business measures? So the interesting, and, and the, the methodology is the same as Les and Peter use for their studies. So we looked at very large business effects. So of all the beautiful, effective campaigns that the IPA Effectiveness Awards has, how much of those are really showing really large effects versus um, medium effects versus smaller effects, and on what measure? So this chart behind you shows the effectiveness of all campaigns. Um, and actually, brand-led if you've got this big 35,000 foot idea, is the most effective way of getting a hard business result. So it's better at driving price premiums, profits, loyalty, market share, sales. If you can really achieve sort of brand-led integration, that's a fantastic thing. We were interested at the time around participation-led. So actually some of those campaigns that we were all lauding two or three years ago um, weren't uh, driving as much uh, business effects as other sorts of campaigns. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, mostly to do with measurement issues and how difficult it is to measure those sorts of campaigns over the long term. But from this, brand-led orchestration was seen as the most effective route to business success. Um, and in terms of brand metrics, so these are the sort of you know, brand awareness, um, brand perception, image statements, actually performed as well as the participation-led campaign. So participation-led really performed on this measure, but actually brand idea-led um, campaigns really performed well. So the, the thought was, is that the organising principle that we need to stop the tablecloth becoming too small or to steer the ship um, further? The campaigns that we studied, um, and I know someone, there's a lot of people here from BBH, um, so they can come back and contradict me on the evolution of this campaign. But for me, this, um, from reading the IP Effectiveness Award, um, the brilliance about this campaign was actually having an idea that was so big and higher purpose and 35,000 foot that it could transcend all the sort of media channels um, and orchestration. So it moved into sponsorship and digital ideas. And when you read the paper, you understand that actually this started off as a sort of ad-led idea, um, and it was really rigidly adhered to for the first 18 months of its life, but then it was morphed, because it's such a big global campaign, it morphed into lots of different iterations, orchestration around this big idea. So for us, that felt like a smart route forward. Um, Honda, I mean, it's always good to talk about Honda, but from my understanding, this was Wyden and Kennedy going to Japan and really studying the foundations of the Honda company and the founder and really trying to find in that DNA something that then could, they could use as a tone or a look and feel that would really drive their communications going forward. So none of the advertising, this is not an advertising campaign that looks the same, it's not coming off in the exact same idea, it's a, an idea that transcends just the advertising manifestation. And the last one, um, HSBC, HSBC. Um, this again, very like Johnny Walker, started off as an ad campaign, um, I think a decade ago from, was it JWT or Lowe who came up with the initial idea, um, really as uh, an answer to an ad brief. Um, and then that had such power within the HSB organisation that it transcended 
it being an advertising campaign and actually moved over the course of time into product development um, and how they're really trying to re-engineer their business or so their global marketing officer, chief marketing officer tells us. Um, so these sorts of campaigns were the ones that really were effective in terms of the IPA effectiveness awards um, and really were sort of punching above their weight. Um, And again, a newer campaign for McDonald's, which is from Les and Peter's um, brilliant work. I'm sure you've all seen it because I've been stealing charts from it all summer. Um, the difference between sort of brand and activation. So their proposal was um, that there should be enough ideas that were big enough, longer term, emotionally driving um, for a brand. And um, companies should spend a large proportion of their budget on those ideas. And then um, looking at what they spend in sort of say, tact more tactical activation ideas. Um, this from them was, you know, 28% of the budget in 2011 was spent on brand. But actually, the econometric modelling said it produced 60% of the impact. So if we can get the sort of balance right between... 35,000 foot emotional connections that transcends the um, silos for business, that has to be part of the way that we can move forward and try and get ourselves out of the scrap that we find ourselves in um, and produce more effective work um, for our clients. Um, again, another one from Les and Peter, which looks at the best emotional campaigns. They talk about fame campaigns that have broader, wider effect, really driving buzz um, and um, emotion. So it's not just emotion, it's actually talking about fame. And actually, fame campaigns versus other emotional campaigns actually perform on loads of different metrics, um, particularly around price sensitivity um, and uh, you know, loyalty and profit. Again, another um, fantastic example of this at work, um, it would be the Axe Links idea, which, I mean, I don't know how, someone from BBH will tell me how long that's been in existence, but 20 years, more than that, 1995. Um, you know, a, a, an idea so strong that actually, if you can't collaborate in a cross-agency team around that idea, because it has such strength and vision and ownership, you can kind of see why that might be pull um, agencies together. So within RSA, we've introduced a new brand purpose that clearly sets out what we're about, what our organisation stands for and where we're going. As an organising uniting principle across our business, which has 20 million customers globally in many, many markets, it helps us with our agencies to deliver great work, to deliver work that really connects with our customers in a powerful way that shows why we're different distinctive and offer real value to our customers. I think I would agree that clients and agencies get what they deserve in the relationship and how they work together. Because ultimately I think as clients, and I'll speak from a client perspective, if we don't invest in the relationship and importantly if we're not clear on our brand, our business, what makes us distinctive and why customers should choose us, then the agency is going to suffer. I think the strongest relationships are where we as client know our DNA, our very being about what we're about, where we're going, our points of difference, where we add real value to customers. Then the agencies we get will respond powerfully to that with great creative. So the more we raise our game and the better we are, the better the agencies we get and the better work we get. And that's the magic formula. Brand can be a fantastic organising principle if it's really clearly articulated. Um, and actually, is this where this dynamic is sort of falling down? So, as far as I'm aware, not that many agencies get remunerated solely on their development of a brand, um, but some design agencies. It tends to be around execution. So brand, that's why many of the campaigns we see in the IP Effectiveness Awards start from an ad campaign and then develop into a bigger um, idea. So is there something around the investment in time? Because actually when you talk to people, the reason they've chose a brand-led approach is not, 
it's not necessarily a conscious decision, decision, it's more pragmatic. It's actually much, much easier to do brand-led orchestration than an advertising-led, because you don't have the same timeline pressures. It's really tricky to produce a campaign that looks and feels the same across 20, 25 different um, marketing channels, each with different stakeholders and silos. It's actually much easier to manage time um, and in-flight decision-making if you have a much looser concept of what that could be, what that, that concept of brand could be. Um, so it does, that upfront, in, upfront investment in time does pay dividends in terms of in-flight decision making. It is easier once you've got your big stakeholders at the top of the organisation. So your CEO absolutely um, bought into that idea. Decision making is much easier because you can compare whether it's um, versus the brand vision, whether this activation is, um, conforms to the brand vision. Um, integration of internal disciplines is incredibly difficult because I think, I think marketing clients, and please contradict me, um, find it even harder to manage internal um, departments um, that are not directly responsible um, to their budgeting as they do their agency partners. Um, and cross-agency collaboration. There's nothing more exciting than um, working in a team that has this powerful vision at the heart and that really unleashes the creativity of all the activation partners there. Um, and potentially the route forward is around incentives. I love the cooperation principles. It is around designing incentives that um, reward cooperation and don't, at the moment, all agency relationships are set up to reward um, egos um, and who can pull the tablecloth closer. It's natural. That's why people behave as they do. But actually, if you invest the client time and resources to set up this inspirational yet realistic vision, it allows you to navigate the stakeholders up front. You can then set a clear scope of work. And I know we're all merging into doing the same sort of function. But actually having a client to say, you know, I, I'll accept ideas in this area from you, I might not from you, or whatever, actually helps ease that process. And incentivizing that collaboration is critical, and potentially paying more for those bigger ideas up front, and decoupling the link to the eventual execution. So I think I did that very quickly, didn't I, Jump? <laughs> Right, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a mm -hmm. few minutes. I'm going to throw some difficult questions to you. Um, firstly, is this a way of helping relationships, or is this just giving them something to fight over? Because in a way, you're saying it's going to be brand-led. You've got multiple stakeholders who will have their own views about what the brand <laughs> leading is, right? And so it was interesting that some of your best examples were advertising-led, really. Yeah. They were advertising dead, and then the brand conformed to the advertising rather than the advertisers conforming to the brand. And I can just see that that could be more conflict rather than less. I just raised that point. Um, uh, I, I think if you have a client with a clear concept of what their brand is, you can get through that. And some, certainly some clients have a clear concept of their brand. Um, but I imagine many people in this room, and I certainly do, work with companies that don't have a clear concept of their brand. Right. They have a very clear concept of their business, but not the articulation or the coherent articulation of that to the outside world. But I think you're right. This needs to be brought in at CEO level. Yeah. You need to get a CEO right. excited that this would be the Which raises forward. the question, uh, one of the questions we've had here, which is the issue of the clients are the ones who see relationships as important and are prepared to invest in them. But if the clients aren't, what if they don't see it as important? How do you, as, a, as one of the multiple stakeholders around the client, your if advice to them, what the heck do you do? I mean, you know, you're, you can't lead because it's not your brand, basically. No, maybe, I, I, maybe you can. I mean, it's a, no, I think that's actually right. I think um, you'd be incredibly arrogant to think you could change an organisation um, from one agency. You need a really powerful idea to do that. And I think um, picking up some of the Libby analysis from Appraise, um, I think that's okay for agencies to um, actually not take the lead all the time. We, we love it because we've got egos, but actually, I, I think a client knows their business mm. more than... Mm. And maybe a, you just have to tell the client, look, there are lots of us, we need you to tell us, to, to guide and conduct. One other final thing was on your effectiveness um, measures, 
I mean, it was true that the, the brand led did come out top, but no integration at all it came out surprisingly yeah. close. I mean, yeah. it wasn't that bad, was it? It was yeah. 74 against 79. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really... I was a bit pitiful, no? I mean, I'm... Well, I was fascinated by that. And actually, if you look at the previous chart, so I think there would have been a bit of a, um, well, integration is always best. So when I, we first started doing this project, it's always better to integrate. You always get you would maximum think, effect. You would, logically, you'd think. Yeah. And actually, on the brand metric side, it that is much true. Better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. is much true. It was double the effectiveness yeah. if you were integrated. Yeah. But if you, if you look at the business measures, actually, it's not quite as clear cut. Yeah. And I think there's some really interesting businesses like charities sometimes like to disintegrate their channels because they find that if they try and push the idea too closely together, they're not actually getting the really hard direct effects. So if they try and make their direct marketing like their TV, actually they get less money into the charity. So they purposefully mm. disintegrate could, the channels. You, you could imagine it's, it, it, the, brand lead, the, the brand leading everything can become a bit, it can suppress some of the creativity, can't it? So you might get, I mean, there's a, there's a merit to having 100 flowers blooming and people yeah. going off and doing stuff. It's messy, but it does have the advantage that no one's thinking, who does my fancy idea, which is a great idea, just doesn't conform to the brand, so we can't do it kind of thing. I mean, there's a, there's a cost to all following this one integrating concept. And, and I guess it's how rigidly you define the yeah. idea. And actually, we were talking in our group before, actually, how can you define an idea that's loose enough, but strong enough yeah. to be both inspirational, yet allow that yeah, creativity? Allow that it's not so Coca-Cola would be a good example. Um, you know, very disparate activation, but actually it's conforming you to... You know exactly what it is, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kate, that was terrific. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.